love which, Eric. Um, I spent a short, a short. There was a short chapter of my life when I spent some time as a party pirate called Scurvy oh Jim. Oh my god! Wow. And I'm getting That's the impression my... from some of the things I see from you on YouTube that you might have done a little party pirating yourself. Yeah, that's my that's my, my dream job. Uh, scurvy Jim. I mean, scurvy is such a good word, and we don't have that in Swedish. So, well, well we have the, the disease scurvy, but it's not such a... It doesn't roll off the tongue, <laughs> right. as the English word does. So I just went with Eric Blackbeard. Eric Blackbeard, that's a good one, though. I yeah. like that. Yeah, I was out of time, so I just had to come up with something. It's basically a... A children's uh, show, um, one man, one man show for for kids mm -hmm. that I uh, I just needed to have to have something to be able to do a show just for kids and uh, pirates seemed seemed like you know fun so, so always yeah. a good choice yeah no it is it was really fun it was it set up the costume and, and everything and and um, so also you did you did scurvy gym okay <laughs> I did for a little while yeah <laughs> wow. What, one of you, one of my you... favorite jokes was to tell the kids that uh, Davy Jones and I had shared a locker at the Pirates Country Club. Oh, very good. <laughs> I felt very clever for that one. <laughs> but you, you, you've got such a man. See, Eric, this is the thing. I don't know where to go now because, like, you mentioned like the like uh, the, the the pirate costume, right? And like, honestly, of course, I'm into your music. That's the main thing. But yeah. I am so impressed by the period clothing of different time periods and places that you wear in photo wow. shoots and and on youtube and stuff like that um so like i say there's just there i feel like there's so much stuff that i could ask you about and just want to hear you talk about um maybe i no, just sure. I mean, trust you, the go flow ahead. you you, you <laughs> take whatever you think is is, is uh, you know nothing is off limits so uh Fair, uh, fair enough. Your, your, your listeners might be a bit confused, but right, uh, yeah. You know, if if they're into this kind of music, I'm sure they already are. So you know, <laughs> they already are. That's right. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Well, um, I uh, let's see here. So, Eric, you have um an impressive command oh, no, of so many uh, languages. It seems as well. I I don't speak any Swedish myself. Um, I wish I did. Oh, it's okay. Not not neither does ninety nine percent of the world. So it's it's quite. <laughs> My my father actually speaks Swedish. Uh, All right. Yeah, he lived in Sweden for a few years, and so when I was a kid, I do remember like we had some like uh, do you call them dala horses, the wooden horses? Yeah, yeah. exactly the dala horses. Sure. I mean, anybody yeah. who goes to Sweden, I'm sure, has to come away with a horse or two. Um, oops, yes, we had not mandatory. We had some of those around the house, and uh, you know, I remember that any time we had split pea soup. Um, mm. art, art sopa, I think it might be called in uh, Swedish. Yeah, sopa, yeah, sure. A anytime we had that, we tried to eat it on a Thursday evening, and my dad always loved looking at us all around the table and saying, "We are joining, you know, everybody in Sweden tonight yeah, in, in right. eating split pea soup." Is that a real yeah, thing? I never knew if he was making that up or not. No, no, no. It's a, it's it's right, correct. Th Thursday evening for some reason, or Thursday for some reason, is the the day when you're supposed to have your split pea soup in Sweden. It's been for ages. Mm -hmm. I have no idea why. Mm -hmm. But it, it's, it's, uh, it's the, the, the other um, like fragment of Swedish that I can remember from my childhood is that my dad, even when speaking English, did do this thing where if you were talking to him, as he was listening, mm -hmm. he would go, oh, yeah, yeah. And he would do oh, the, oh, this one. Yeah, that thing, yeah. and The, the sucking in uh, when you... <laughs> Suck the wind in through your lips, and you, like, yeah, yeah, in ingressive exactly. speech. I think is yeah, that... that's uh, that's a thing from they do up in the north of Sweden. Ah, okay, see that makes sense. Yeah. I heard a joke once that uh, the best way to clean under your bed in northern Sweden was to stick someone's head under there and then ask yeah. if they want to come out. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, and they would. <laughs> yeah, no, because it's 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 the, supposedly the the more north you go, the more. Uh, taciturn and silent people would get and in the end they would just go uh, and they wouldn't say yes they would just go like that <laughs> which means yes it's sort of vaguely well it's uh, affirmative in some sense that's an affirmative so, huh yeah. well i it's, it's... i hate to just like make um broad assumptions about a culture and a place that of no, course please, is varied and everything right. But um, I was reading a while ago, uh, It was I think it was when ABBA came out with their more recent album, you know? Um, oh, yeah. The, the post posthumous. That's right, yeah. <laughs> and, 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 I, and, I, and I so I was reading a little bit about ABBA. I mean, I mean like, of course, I've listened to them all my life and, and like their music very much mm. and everything. But um, I read a note from somebody somewhere. I wish I could find it again because I would cite them and try to figure out 
what they were getting at. But somebody mentioned, they suggested that like these um, very emotive melody lines, often maybe mm. dark uh, kind of uh, melodic movements, they suggested that these are um, uh, like staples and characteristics of Swedish folk music and oh, yeah, that sure. it had influenced um, ABBA. And that this, yeah. and they suggest this comes from the long winters and how much time you spend in darkness and things like that, right? Um, mm -hmm. But what do you think of that, Eric? Does that does that sound like no, a fair no, assessment? I mean, I mean the, the 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 pianist in ABBA, Benny Andersson, mm. uh, has especially after ABBA, he took on a new a new uh, career as a basically as a folk musician and uh, played the accordion and wrote uh, lots of folk tunes and, and popped up in, in uh, folk circles. And I, I don't know if he did that before ABBA, but I, I guess, I, I would guess so, because usually, I mean, he grew up in the 50s probably, and, and uh, uh, back in the 70s when I grew up, you would still, if you turn on the TV in the afternoon, you would have some uh, show with like, uh, uh, well, being an American, you would know Lawrence Welk. Supposedly. Oh, sure, yeah. Yeah, exactly, and and the the Prairie Home Companion mm -hmm. stuff like that. Yeah, absolutely. We we would have the Swedish uh, counterpart on TV at, at all times, basically, mm -hmm. in in the seventies and in the fifties. So you were sort of you, you couldn't escape it. And then after that, I mean, the eighties and nineties, it it's it it disappeared out of fashion. So you weren't as inundated uh, as a child. But, <laughs> mm. And that, that I, I suppose that was the case with uh, Benny from ABBA as well. And so he also supposedly always had this uh, underlying knowledge and, and familiarity with Swedish uh, folk music, hmm. which uh, uh, because he, uh, yeah, I mean, I guess he played the accordion, which is like a staple instrument in, in traditional folk music. And, it is uh, interesting. That's yeah, yeah, I, yeah sure. And, um, and he, I, I can definitely see how he would, uh, because he was the tune smith mm. with, with the, doing the melodies basically and Bjorn. The other guy playing uh, the guitar would be uh, more of the text guy, lyrics. Mm. Um, so, so Benny had this uh, always. I mean, to this day, they, they did lots of musicals and stuff afterwards. And to this day, he has this reputation of being an excellent um, a melody maker, obviously. And uh, the Swedish folk music is is full of of these catchy tunes, definitely. And uh, and also the rhythms you can find some uh, because ABBA had a very peculiar uh, particular way of arranging their tunes with respect to the melody and the, the rhythms mm. which uh, you can certainly argue that you can find that in Swedish elements of it at least in, in folk music mm. so, well and, and when it comes to talking about Swedish folk music um, yeah can you tell me what it means to be a is it Rick Spellman Rick Spellman yeah you, you are Spellman, one right yeah. exactly yeah, it's an honorary title. Basically, that you it's like an award that you get for um, for being supposedly good at what you do in terms of folk music, and uh, it's it's basically it means the status of a. Um, it, 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 well, it's, it translates nat national musician. Uh, Spelman is the the word for musician in the folk music sense. Um, Spiel is uh, playing and man is person, so playing person, I guess you would say. Mm. Uh, and um, uh, yeah, so basically, you, you anyone who wants to can once a year take your folk instrument and you play a couple of tunes for uh, in front of a jury of old, very knowledgeable uh, Spiel men, and they mm. would uh, judge the way you play and how how much you know about the tradition and and etc and the whole thing is that it it to, it's it's supposed to help to pass on the traditions to to younger people and so on it was um, started in the early 20th century by a famous uh, swedish uh, artist who painted uh, like very uh, idyllic paintings of the swedish landscape and, mm. and loved he loved all things uh both in terms of folklore and stuff and he uh, set aside a, 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 a set of money for this award, which unfortunately today people think that if you're Expelman, you get like a, some sort of sal salary or funding from the state. But it's if only, huh? not true. You, you don't get anything. You, you get diddly squat is what you get, <laughs> um, <laughs> except for the enormous prestigious uh, honor of being called the Expelman. So I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm not um, you know, uh, annoyed at all because they <laughs> don't yeah. give us lots of money. Though, though, if they did, I mean, it would be okay, right? It would be. Yeah, no, I, I yeah. sure. I mean, <laughs> they used to have this thing that 
you would get a, a artistic salary that if mm. you were very prominent you could get a, a, a like a stipend of, of I don't know how much maybe ten thousand dollars a year or something just for um, for doing I'm, I'm not sure if that's still around but it's it's, uh, it's always been a cause of Swedish envy mm. which is that's a whole other thing we could talk about for hours the the whole notion of Nordic uh, concept of uh, envy and um, the mm. Jantelagen that you must not believe that you are better than anyone else or you will be put down immediately. <laughs> that's it's something that my dad certain. told me about, actually. That, that sounds about oh, really? yeah. the tall poppy I mean, you find thing. the same thing in, in, the, nor- in the northern U.S., in, in, in the, the Dakotas and Minnesota and so on. <laughs> you find the, the same mindset which the immigrants from Sweden and Norway, Denmark would bring to the States, which sort of clashes with the whole American notion of, of uh, how you're, you know, how you're supposed to handle life. No, that, that's funny that you mentioned that because I, th- though I grew up uh, where I am right now in the Western United States, my, my dad moved there, moved here when he grew up. He, he, he was a child in South Dakota as well. So he's kind of got oh, really? this wow. culturally uh, doubled up on him. <laughs> so Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, now, been, oh, go ahead. Been, no, sorry. No, just we've been performing at a um, uh, number of like tours and trips and um in, in that, I mean, all over the U.S. really, uh, most on the West Coast, mostly in California, and uh, but also a couple of really big uh, like Nordic fairs, like mm-hmm. the, uh, the there's a thing called the Norsk Hust Fest, which is in in uh, Minot in uh, North Dakota. Um, it's the, uh, like a, a huge event where they have like it's in, at the state fair when they have I don't know twenty thousand people coming there and celebrating uh, Nordic heritage. For a whole week, and we've mm. been playing music there for a couple of times, and it's 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 more much more Swedish than you would ever find anywhere over here. So <laughs> how funny! <laughs> it's, it's, more, yeah, it was, it's it's a it's an experience. More sure. Swedish than in Sweden, huh? Oh yeah, much more so. Yeah, mm. oh, it's it's mm. interesting. Well, that, that, yeah, got me thinking about the whole um, jante the jante jante logen, which doesn't have anything to do with music really but it, it's it's uh, it's lots of explanations about the nordic psyche goes back to that yeah but so, i yeah. i I, it, I think i really enjoy that kind of um i don't know the kind of thoughts that maybe maybe it's like questions that maybe never quite have answers but it's still fun to think about the ways in oh, which yeah. different aspects of culture for many generations, sure. influence an individual even in their own short life and how they make music and how they yeah, interact the, with music the, from the past and all. Yeah, I mean, there are tons of those. And, and that sort of dovetails nicely into the whole early music thing as well, of course, because that that's when you, if you do um, medieval music, you have the, the, same, uh, quest, the same questions to deal with. You know, how would people approach music 600 years ago? And, and uh, which in a way is... Um, both easier and more difficult to get to than with folk music because you actually have a lot of written sources for the for the medieval stuff which you mm. don't have with folk music. You always look at it through some kind of lens. Mm. Yeah. Uh, so the problem is to to get to the source directly, of course. Which yeah, uh, yeah. Which you worked with a lot of sources for this um, music for a plague album, mm. thirteen fifty yeah. music for a plague. Because yeah, it, exactly. so, it's not just Swedish. We've got stuff from Italy and... and, and no, no, I no, think... no, exactly. I mean, there, there is actually quite little, uh, not so much... Maybe uh, nothing from Sweden? Not so many. <laughs> yeah, and now, exactly. There weren't many people in Sweden who could write back then, and, and uh, all the chronicles and everything is mostly from Italy and France. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I was... We were hard-pressed to find anything uh, in from Swedish sources, except that, you know, most... Lot, lots of people died, which, you know, well, thanks. It's not so informative. <laughs> Par for the course. <laughs> yeah. It sort of goes with the whole um, description of the plague in the first place. Yeah. So, no, it was, it's, there are really few sources from Swedish, uh, um, Swedish, few Swedish sources. So, um, I mean, the whole, the whole idea for that project was obviously the, the COVID pandemic. And, and um, we, because I, I always had this interest about obviously the Middle Ages and, and, uh, slightly morbid interest into the, the, the Black Death as well. And mm-hmm. uh, it, it sort of came to a head during the COVID plague when, the COVID plague, the COVID uh, epidemic, when um, I just... Re- Did you say the recognized... COVID plague by accident just now? Did yeah, that just come out exactly. naturally? <laughs> yeah, the COVID plague, yeah. I don't have, haven't heard anyone call it that, but, you know, might might catch on. 
It's been S- off. Speaking of which, just so you know, some of my bagpiping friends who I informed that I would be talking to you. Oh, um, yeah. I, I told them, oh, you know, and I, and I listed a few of your albums, mm. and one of them said, oh, the Plague Piper. That's great that you're talking to the Plague Piper. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm ecstatic that someone in the States and there's someone referring to me as the Plague Piper or the Plague Guy. You know, yeah, which, oh, which to I be might... fair, I'm not sure if it's you or Anna who played pipes most on that album. But So the Plague Pipers, maybe, we ought to say. No, hmm. it's, it's, it's mostly me. Is uh, it? Okay, so fair enough. You are the Plague Piper. Oh, sure. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, 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 it's you know, I, if I had thought of that myself, that would make an excellent handle for my my Instagram or something. Yeah, <laughs> Plague Piper. So I'm, I'm, maybe I should start with that now. If if Eric the if Eric the Blackbeard doesn't work out, you can switch oh, exactly, over to yeah. the, Plague Eric the Plague Piper. Yeah. <laughs> I felt I feel kind of bad sometimes. I don't know if I ought to. There's there's a kind of um, mm, I feel like. You mentioned being drawn to sort of like the the sort of like uh, morbidity of things like you know the the dance macabre yeah. that comes up in this in this yeah, album exactly. and things like that. Um, I feel drawn to that as well. And sometimes I wonder, like, how is it that I'm listening to this album, for example, and and reading through the accompanying booklet that has so much to do with death, and I'm smiling mm. so much throughout, you know. <laughs> yeah. And I wonder <laughs> if maybe you could tell me a little bit about what you were thinking because you mentioned a few places in your jacket for this album about like um, how different people reacted to the 14th century plague um, in different ways. Some of them maybe wrote love songs. Some of them danced. Some of them started whipping themselves, you know, like talk to me about that. Well, 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 I mean, the whole whole idea of of the album came from uh, because I recognized the reactions to the COVID epidemic. Uh, I realized that I recognized a lot of those from when I read about the plague many years ago, the Black Death, and mm. and um, so I looked up the sources and found that found that there were the whole range of human emotions that we did find in the COVID response. We did did also find in the in the medieval response. Mm. Uh, so obviously we knew we know a bit more about germs and and um, um, biology today, medicine, but the underlying. Um, the psyche or or the the response to such a, a thing is there are so many things which are in parallel like you know hoarding of beat toilet paper or, or food mm. or and you uh, and uh, closing off some people and and uh, banding together to outsiders and coming up with uh, more or less crazy theories which even people at the time thought were crazy like today mm. um, and I mean there are just so many. Um, and and you had some people want, that really wanted to do a strict um, scient- scientific response and some people who just went around screaming it was the curse of God and both sides sort of despised each other, mm. basically like it is today. And uh, there was just so many points like that which, which came up when I started looking into it. So, and, and, and then you also have the, the humor aspect, which is, you know, one way of dealing with such a... It, it's so, I mean... When the plague started, you, there were around 50 million people in Europe, and when it ended, there were like 30 left, mm. uh, 30 million left. So, you, according to some estimates, so at, at least 20 million people, which would be nearly half, or at least a third of of everyone, uh, yeah, in um, in in all of Europe, would have died off. Uh, the, the, the the numbers differ a lot, of course, depending on where you look, but a lot of people died. Is the gist of it, basically, and. Uh, so the way you react to such a you know disaster on such a almost cosmic scale is obviously that you can only sort of laugh it off in in one way because it's so ab- absurd. And mm-hmm. um, one of my favorite movies of all time is obviously Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Okay, <laughs> which uh, there are some cameos in in the album. Uh, I thought there must uh, be. I was going to ask you like yeah, what, especially yeah. like as it's going out the processio uh, yeah, flagellantorum. flagellantorum thing. Yeah, yeah that, I just thought exactly. is that Monty Python? What's going on? Oh there? yeah, it's lifted. It's lifted straight off. I, mean, I, I should pay royalties to them for, for that actually. <laughs> they don't need it. They're fine. No. <laughs> Thank you. 
sort of captures the whole um, absurd uh, notion of the Middle Ages perfectly, mm. which is, uh, if you read medieval stories, you have the whole range from, you know, the very pompous uh, Arthurian legends to the extremely absurd um, writings of, uh, like, Boccaccio or, or Chaucer or these very famous guys who you would think that they were very, you know... Um, also quite pompous in their writing, but I mean, some of the stuff from, from the Canterbury Tales or the mm. Decameron is, it's just pure slapstick with, uh, it's so silly. And then the next story would be very serious, uh, maybe, or something. And, or, you know, with music, you have the the same range of, of emotions from uh, absurd to uh, to really uh, highbrow stuff. So mm. it's, uh, which, which, I mean, which you do find in, in modern culture as well, albeit over a much grander scale or, or bigger, obviously on a much bigger setting from mm. between extremes, but but still the the way uh, y- yeah, it's it's just fun to to look for look, to look at places where um, things where we uh, where our twenty first century minds uh, sort of collide with fourteenth century minds. Which mm. obviously, I mean, if we were to meet a person from the fourteenth century, we we would be hard pressed to find things too to have in common, I guess. Um, but maybe so it, plague just, is one of them we could talk about, huh? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, after COVID, we, we all learned more about ourselves. In, mm. in I, I wondered, um, you mentioned that, uh, the, that the third track on the album, which I, I have, I don't speak French uh, or Italian, and so I have a hard time, but Quangier Le Spart, something like that? Yeah. Where you're playing yeah, exactly. the, or, the organ, the, the portative organ? Um, uh, yeah, exactly. You mentioned there that the guy who'd written the song did a lot of co- composing in his quarantine in the 14th century. Yeah, that would be uh, exactly that would be uh, Guillaume de Machaut, who was one of the like uh, super famous musicians. He, even in, his, in in that day, in the middle of the 14th century, he would have been known to um, lots of people, uh, not as a musician but as as a poet, which was um, mm. considered much more uh, prestigious in the day. Mm. Um, but then he also wrote music on his in his spare time, basically. Thank you. 
Yeah, so so he, he describes it's it's an extremely long poem that is uh, uh, it touches on all kinds of stuff and and it's um, lots of it is quite un, un, uninteresting, fairly, but but it's um, frankly, but it's um, uh, he, he touches upon this whole uh, describes the whole thing when he went into hiding uh, to took up place in a monastery or a nunnery actually uh, specifically I don't know <laughs> not sure how he got in there but he, he managed somehow and he stayed there for two years and, and he wrote music and wrote poems and just looked out the window every now and then to see if someone were coming if someone had uh, changed outside because they didn't even get any messen- messengers from outside so he just describes this in great detail and then uh, at one point he um, actually sees people that come towards the nunnery and they are all happy and they make music and they play on uh, lots of different instruments that he um, lists uh, and it's bagpipes and it's uh, drums and everything and they um, they have a, a great time basically and he realizes that uh, the plague has finally passed away and mm. passed over so um, so yeah and, and it, it's uh, I didn't know about that so that was one of my own finds I was happy to to come across it um, did, did you feel still, had you come across it? Was it like during the the quarantines of COVID nineteen that you came across that account? Yeah, so? yeah, exactly. I I just have a had to read through uh, lots of of uh, Macho's poetry because I I thought he must have mentioned this somewhere in, in mm-hmm. uh, about the plague because he was born around uh, the year thirteen hundred and we know that he died in thirteen seventy seven. Mm. So he would be in his fifties, forties, fifties when the plague hit, and you know. Uh, there, there are there are very few songs about, uh, especially by by him. No, no specific about the plague, and no songs from any known composer specifically, uh, except for the that we might touch upon later, the flagellants. Yes, where we do have uh, explicit uh, plague songs, of course. I, I did but, really uh, like hearing you play that portative organ. It's one of my favorite. Yeah, uh, that's thanks. one of my favorite it's, tracks and one of my favorite instruments that I see you playing. It's just so interesting. Well, thank you. It's 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 a nice instrument. We were many like in the early two thousands. We had a, a friend who uh, worked at in in Gothenburg, you know, Sweden. Uh, they had a the university there had a big uh, project of of uh, research into historical organs and copies of like baroque organs. And um, this guy um, Andreas Brauner from Germany, he he worked there, and uh, they had just finished construction on. One of the biggest organs in the whole world, which was a, a, like a copy of a 17th century German organ that was shipped off to South Korea, I think, where it was mm. supposed to be installed in a big church. And it was like a organ with uh, 1,200 pipes and, and it was just enormous beyond belief. And uh, after that, he uh, he had this notion of building a very tiny organ instead. You go and, to the uh, other extreme. Yeah, So he, exactly. So he... He wanted to construct a, a copy of a, or a, a, a rep, not a replica, but a, a like a reconstruction of a medieval organetto or a portative organ. Mm. And we got in touch somehow, and he knew that we really wanted to get one. So he started to to build it, and after like a year or something, it was finished. And and uh, yeah, I was just very happy to to get it because uh, there are very few makers of portative organs these days. Yeah. Were you, were you able to? Is that where you were able to throw your weight around as a Rick Spellman? Be like, you know, do you know who I am? I, uh, <laughs> I am yeah, Rick exactly. Spellman. <laughs> Make no, me an I, organ. I don't, <laughs> I, I don't think so. I, <laughs> I was on, on, a, on a different track, probably. But mm. uh, yeah, I should have done that maybe. Will you? Will you describe for me? Because I've watched you play it a bit, and and a few other players as well. Um, it, and I, I gathered that you're pumping bellows with one hand while the other hand plays the melody. It seems yeah, like yeah, there's sure. a drone I mean, going though. Are you holding yeah, the key down for the yeah, drone, exactly. or does that lock I mean, in place? Yeah, exactly. There, there were, um, as far as we can tell, there were uh, lots and lots of different versions, but they all show uh, in in medieval manuscripts. You can from the it, basically from between the 12th to the 15th century, you see angels sometimes, but more often dance musicians and and musicians in, musicians in general that would use the organ. So it's not a, a, a liturgical instrument at all or, or connected with the church it was more of a, a dance instrument mm. used for dance music or, or um, secular love songs or anything so it didn't have any of the connotations with uh, churches or um, sacred music at all the other on the other hand actually 
Mm. And uh, yeah, so basically you hold it, uh, you rest it on your left leg if, if you're right-handed, and uh, with your left hand you pump one single bellows, bellow, and then... I'm not, I right never hand. know how to say that, yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, one bellow, bellow yeah. Sounds, sounds weird, because you usually have, have two bellows, yeah. so they work uh, in concert, so to say. But since this one only has one, uh, that means that you actually run out of air, so you have to take a breath and uh, ah. and make a pause in the music uh, so it's it's more similar to playing on a like a, a, a consort of of recorders or flutes mm, yeah. basically because it's uh, you have like two octaves um, of a range with uh, basically of each pipe is is uh, like a recorder on different of different lengths and mm -hmm. uh, then on this particular instrument you can uh, uh, because it's so early, so it didn't, uh, it doesn't have uh, keys um, or tangents uh, or keys, I guess you would say, like piano keys, which later or organs did have, obviously. Mm. Uh, so this one has little buttons instead, like push, but that, that you push. And on this particular instrument, uh, the the maker made it so that if you twist one of the push buttons, um, you uh, you. Uh, how do you say? You lock the drone, or you lock ah, that gotcha. pack to play. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So then you get a drone. So it's it's very clever because then you can uh, you put that in the in the lower reg register, and then you can play um, uh, which you wouldn't reach otherwise because you only have one hand. So that, yeah. that sort of limits what you can actually play. I um, see. Well, and so, yeah. kind of on the opposite end of the spectrum in terms of like instrumentation that we hear on this album then I guess hmm. and I wonder too if it's on the opposite end of sort of like how long you've been playing and how comfortable you might be because uh, you do play a lot of harp you oh, mentioned yeah. the the flagellation folks and how they had music that was maybe specific to the plague um yeah. I really I really enjoy track two on this album I enjoy it hmm. musically anyway Maria Unser Frau. Frau yeah exactly yeah. A, a, a song to the holy Mary yeah, and that's right. a beautiful song, and you play it beautifully. I also appreciated well, that you mentioned that uh, you shortened it here because the original had over fifty verses, and you said yeah. uh, you said making sure that it would last, <laughs> that it would last for even an extended flagellation spree. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's no, what they, you they were... need when you're <laughs> when you're engaging in flagellation as a soundtrack that'll last. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean these guys they they meant business. They were really serious <laughs> about their. They're very serious about and, it. <laughs> and uh, yeah, they, they knew what they uh, wanted and what they liked, and they, they kept doing it. You know, good for them. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> they, so they, found, uh, they found their passion I mean, in life. <laughs> yeah, no, you know. So sie weit ein Engel gesandt, kühne Lesung, Herr was Gabriel genannt, Alleluia.
Uh, it might be, be way more than 50 verses, uh, mm-hmm. at least for some of these songs. They, they are page up and page down with, with, uh, with lyrics. Well, and so, one can imagine that it, you get to the end and somebody, you know, somebody gets up from the muck and yells, one more time! Yeah, <laughs> exactly. You know, it's like uh, folk singers that believe that singing uh, 200 verses of, on top of Old Smoky is twice as enjoyable as singing 100 verses. <laughs> right, that's the rule, so, yeah. <laughs> would have the same here, obviously, that they would... Well, I mean, they, they also tell... These songs tell the story of some biblical event and uh, mm. this one basically uh, tells the story of um, uh, how Mary gives birth to Jesus Christ and... It's all in in great detail, and and uh, so you're supposed, to, and it's all sung in in uh, the language that everyone knew, like in Middle High German, I think would be the mm. language here. So um, if you sang it, you would actually understand what you were singing. In, in yeah. Um, contrast to singing Latin hymns, which no, no one outside of the clergy would understand. So uh, and and supposedly here also people would join in the chorus, and um, even people that you passed by maybe on the street, and they would get. Uh, I mean, the music was also a way for the flagellants to uh, to uh, speak to to normal people and to have them maybe join in and uh, hopefully even join in the flagellation as well. W- eventually, was that the was that the goal of these groups? Like, were were they flagellating the people around them or only themselves and each other? And was it like an invitation to come join us? Yeah. <laughs> Who knows? I, I don't. No, do you um, know? <laughs> yeah. No. I mean, that they, as as far as I can can um, surmise, they they flagellated most of themselves to to with great uh, aplomb, and they they loved yeah. you know, uh, it, um, basically it was a way of of uh, punishing, the, because they saw, in the sources say that. Uh, when they punished themselves and did bodily harm, they that was their way of of accepting uh, the punishment of like the plague was obviously the punishment of God for sins that were committed. Mm-hmm. So by by um, uh, subjecting themselves to even more physical pain and punishment, they would help to get the plague. It would pass. Uh, it would um, get they get rid of the plague quicker if if they added to the. Oh, like there is some a, of the pain. The maybe world, there's basically. like a certain amount of suffering that must happen, and so yeah. if they hurry up and suffer, then it can be done with. Yeah, that's one one idea of of the mm. whole notion of flagellants. Uh, I mean, it's supposed to. I guess it started with just one guy, uh, you know, uh, whipping him, and, and because of the flagellants, the fl- flagellum would be the name of a specific type of whip mm. with like a, like a cat and nine tails, which we spoke about yeah. Paris before. So like a. a Specifically, a devious kind of whip that has all, all those little hooks that would get stuck in in the in the flesh, so it would be uh, extremely painful. Mm. And uh, I think that was that was a practice known among uh, Christian, uh, you know, very fervent believers back to the tenth, eleventh uh, century or something. So it, that wasn't new for the plague. It was just that it it caught on and uh, and uh, caught on very quickly, and uh, uh, you didn't see it in these amounts of. Uh, mass of people doing it at the same time in like coding. I always had this image of <laughs> I wanted to do if, if you know if I ever do a, a my own film version of the Holy Grail that would be a, a giant dance I, I always feel that they should have included that in, in, the, in that movie like a giant dance number with mm. 100 people doing flagellation in synchronization 
Yeah. In synchronization. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, and, and, yeah. Um, so, I mean, yeah, because, and, and, but then they would, they would invite people and um, take them up into their, uh, their uh, procession basically. And uh, it, it wasn't like they uh, flagellated or whipped themselves the whole time, but, but they had, there's also a description and I, I should have included that a bit more in the booklet, but I'll save that for part two maybe. Mm. Um, that's described what happened when they would come to a town and they would go to the town square and they would they would have a, a quite um, uh, quite a complicated ritual that would follow and they would do this and would do that and they would just stand in a circle and they would lay down, prostrate themselves on the on the floor or on the on the on the ground rather. And uh, you know, one guy. Yeah, it's it's all described in great detail um, how they would go about, and they would they would uh, do the whole whipping thing, obviously, and they would sing uh, the songs. So, mm. uh, and and then they had people joining in, going with them to the next city because they wanted to see the reactions also of the of the people, because lots of people thought they were just totally, utterly batshit crazy. Uh, ah, so so the then. group gets bigger as they go along. Yeah, it, it does. I mean, there were thousands of people in in the end, and. And also the irony, of course, is that they wanted to end the plague, but they helped spreading it quite effectively <laughs> because there were there were so many of them, and they 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 went from town to town. So uh, without doubt, they helped to with, to with, with probably it. open wounds and leaving behind. Oh samples yeah, yeah, of their, exactly. Yeah. Because you know, whipping yourself during <laughs> yeah. time of plague is probably not the the smartest thing to do. Hmm. So yeah. Now, now, so there's there's that um, sort of like. Uh, reaction to the plague uh where large groups of people get together for the flagellation parties you you also talk about how some groups of people got together to dance and sing yeah. and have parties and i feel like a great tune from the album a great uh, or is it a set of tunes um mm. here would be uh track five o ognor mitrovo yeah yeah exactly the, the bagpipe Just yeah. beautiful bagpipe <laughs> chaos there. It's just yeah, so no, fun. I, I always had a thing for, for uh, bagpipes playing very un-bagpipey tunes. Yeah, what a great dance tune, really. Oh, that cool. one makes yeah, me want to dance that was for the, sure. The whole idea. That also, because you, you would, yeah, there are lots of examples of, of um, even uh, sacred music being used in, in terms of, of playing at as dance music. And, and the other way around, you would have a, a tune, a melody that everyone would know, and you would. Uh, weave it into a, a mass or something like if you took today if you took the, the latest taylor swift hit song and you would uh, construct a whole mass around that theme you know that would be uh, mm.
Yeah, so, so I mean, with with that Ognor um, Mitro, uh, which is a, a composition of another of these giant medieval composers that sadly today are all but forgotten, which in this case is Francesco Landini from Florence in Italy, who uh, was, a, he was a very famous uh, organetto, the portative organ. Was his oh, there it is again, yeah. Yeah, so it, it was even... On his tombstone in Italy, you can uh, oh, really? go there and visit. And yeah, he's a very nice tombstone where he holds the ex- one one of those types of organs. Mm. Uh, so yeah, and 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 that tune, uh, I, I just thought it made a good uh, like you have this other type of tune called a saltarello or trotto, which are the two big uh, dance type of tunes uh, from the 14th, 15th century Italy. Uh, and uh, I thought this would be like a slightly more intelligent polyphonic version of those uh, mm. uh, tunes and um, because it, I mean it's quite tricky music uh, it's this, this as you say the the two voices and it, it I mean it could be you could have four or five voices but this one mm. is uh, two and they really interweave in in a very clever way so where one voice uh, stops the other one sort of fills in which is something you would on the bagpipe it's not just you don't think of a bagpipe straight away when you do that. I mean, you, it's, it's, no. you can play it on a shawm or something where you can actually um, breathe in between because the bagpipe, of course, is famous for never stopping. It never stopping. Keeps... Once it starts, it just keeps going. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, but, but of course, there are ways you can get around it, which we try to do there. So we actually do stop uh, the right sometimes. Speaking of which, were were these were both voices coming from Swedish bagpipes or was one of them a, like a border pipes or some other kind? No, the, yeah, exactly. No, these aren't Swedish pipes. They are, I think it's uh, two French pipes. Uh, technically, one is, is English, an English borer pipe, which is mm. the same construction as a French uh, double reed uh, bagpipe, uh, s- slightly uh, more um, closely related to the very famous Scottish bagpipe. It's mm-hmm. not quite as loud, but the same construction. But you have, uh, due to some clever uh, boring and drilling and whole you you have actually a full chromatic scale which you don't mm. get on the scottish bagpipe um so you can play all these um, fancy notes on on that one and i mean it's 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 a bit of a, a sport to find these medieval tunes which uh, fit on the on the bagpipe because you have obviously less range than with other instruments yeah. but but surprisingly many fit straight away can you tell me about how, what, like what very, I'm, I'd imagine you have different ways of going about finding, transcribing, adjusting and arranging, but um, do you have mm. some maybe favorite methods or methods that come up mo- most often? Um, you know, are you digging through archives at a library or are you listening to existing yeah, yeah. collections to get ideas? Well, I mean, it's, 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 uh, w- when I started out, I, I really wanted to be as, as, um, uh, uh, serious as humanly possible. So I, I, I wanted to tr- try to learn the uh, medieval mensural notation and uh, looked for original notation and manuscripts and everything. But it's it's it takes so much time. Uh, I mean, these days, obviously, you can get you can find a lot of of, uh, of every, almost everything is is uh, that you that we know of is scanned and exists online. Mm-hmm. Uh, then of course uh, it's I haven't I, I always wanted to go out and like a trip and, and visit monasteries in Italy and just you know discover lost musical treasures in their attic or yeah. something. But uh, right, yeah, it, it's still a dream to do that. So no, mo- mostly it's mostly it's um, uh, I look through um, because there are all these great editions of medieval music uh, that was made. There's, like for example, there's a book series called the, the Polyphonic Music of the 14th Century, which mm. is, uh, I think, uh, an American uh, uh, edition from the 60s or 70s, which is uh, you know, 20, 20 books, volumes, where oh. with the, in modern notation, uh, with um, just so someone did all the the fancy work of of the hard work of transcribing the medieval notation to modern notation, which is because that means that you can. Uh, at least me, because I never got quite fluent in reading uh, medieval notation. Uh, mm. So I so I just looked through the different uh, secondary sources then and and, and uh, try lots of tunes and see which, which appeals to me on a personal level, I guess. If we were looking at um, like a piece of modern staff paper next to a piece of uh, medieval notation, mm. is 
like in my in my mind i feel like i'm imagining like uh squares instead of circles uh, yeah sure maybe I mean, fewer lines on the staff but still a staff or what yeah what, what, no, absolutely. what are some I mean, of the, the key the, things I and mean, one of the problems is that you, you would have different styles in different countries. So you have like French notation and you have Italian, uh -huh. Intel, Italian notation and stuff. And they're slightly different, of course. Uh, and you never quite know what they mean when they write a, a specific squiggle. Um, <laughs> then yeah. at, at the end of Middle Ages, this sort of uh, coalesces into a, something that becomes the modern standard notation. But so the earlier you get, obviously, the more different it, it, it is uh, from each other. And uh, also, I mean, in the Middle Ages, you would have... a like yeah, the the Catholic Church to this day uses standard Gregorian mensural notation, which is what you would have in the late Middle Ages. Then you have four lines, and uh, indeed mm -hmm. square notes. Um, but then you can have like tilted square notes, which means a, a specific combination of notes, and you would have oh. to know what that means because you can't tell uh, straight from just from looking at it. So you would have to 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 learn how to interpret it first. And uh, the thing is also that it, because that was made originally for Gregorian chant, which isn't very big on rhythm, um, it, mm. it doesn't really um, show the length of the notes. So uh, even if you learn to read, the, you can read the pitches quite uh, specifically, but the the rhythm is quite diff uh, quite hard to uh, to learn to, to, mm. to learn from the from the notation. Uh, so that's why also when you Often, when you hear medieval tunes from different uh, uh, musicians and different recordings, they the pitches are generally the same, more or less, but then the rhythm can be very different depending on how it was interpreted, and and that is one one of the fun things about it because it makes it, uh, you know, leaves a lot of bit still up for personal interpretation while you mm. still know you can still see the pitches, so you will still have a, an inkling of how it is supposed to sound, which is, uh, you know, obviously a, a big help. But yeah. I mean, if you go look back to the beginning of notation around the year 1000, you would have before a very clever monk by the name of Guido in the town of Arezzo in Italy, who came up with the whole idea of, of having a, a, a red line that would denote the note C, and then uh, did more lines for each note. And that's where we get the Do, Re, Mi scale, which was originally called the Ut, Re, Mi scale. Oh. Uh, because he 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 found a um, maybe you know this already so excuse me for I, I don't know you go oh it's on. Good, actually no, <laughs> thank you this is another uh, interest of mine uh, slightly obscure but um, no he found this this monk in the late tenth century found this uh, I don't know if he composed or if he found this uh, Gregorian chant which is called Utquant laxis resonare fibris mira gestorum and so on. And for every first line, the pitch rises. It raises one one note, basically. So then he took the first uh, syllable of each note and had the C would be the ut, later changed to a do for some other reason. And then we'd have the re and then the mi, fa, sol, la, si. Really? Added later. So that, that's how we get the ut re mi or the do re mi do re mi like uh, basically exact the same as in the sound of music song right where uh, where you have the same the same type of song that it, the pitch follows the name of, of the name of the pitch so it's it's very clever mm. um and and that took off very quickly when he uh, uh put out this idea uh, even in a world before social media and facebook it is spread like wildfire <laughs> and and uh there's a famous story where uh, this Guido learned the, his system to. Uh, he also invented something called the Guidonian hand, where uh, you, you would use the. Um, if you hold up your hand, you see the. Uh, what's the English word? You know, your finger you ha it has different, uh, like notches. Uh, knuckles or, or the yeah, creases. Yeah, the knuckles. Yeah. Uh, which sort of looks like lines, three lines. Yep. And so he would point at, at, at his finger and show which notes. You would sing uh. <laughs> from from looking at the, the lines in your hand, which is very yeah. clever. I'm looking uh, at my hand right now and just imagining it. That's yeah, really exactly. Fun. And there there's some um, images of um, medieval il illuminations where a, a monk or something is holding up his right hand and and pointing with his left hand on his fingers. And what he oh, does then goodness. is show which notes to sing for the for the people. And I, so, I know I've seen paintings like that. I just yeah, I, I would yeah. assume they were like giving a blessing or something. Yeah, no, I no, no. They would actually it. teach the tell tell the tell the singers which uh, specific pitches to sing. Uh, so Guido learned he, he taught this system to the the chaplain or the headmaster of the 
choir of the Pope in Rome. And uh, uh, when he had learned that, he went there and he uh, provided them with sheet music for a new composition that they had never heard before. And to everyone's amazement, they could sing this without uh, her, without, uh, without learning having heard it ear first. Yeah. Because up, up to that point, you would have to remember all these tunes mm. uh, by ear, by uh, by memory, obviously. Yeah. So that was like the first uh, one of the first um, revolutions in in music when when this was possible. You could actually save music on the paper and recall it uh, at a later time if you couldn't recall it by by. Memory you could recall it from from the notation, which was a good thing. Yeah. Because before then, you had something called the neumes, which means uh, signs. Basically, then then you will have the musicians would just squiggle basically arrows uh, in the lyrics in the, in the Bible. Basically, they would they would uh, write arrows going here. The pitch goes up, and here the pitch goes down. Yeah, and uh, that, that would be like a help to uh, for the singers to memorize how the melody went. But you could. Uh, you can you can't learn a new memory you can't learn a new song from that you can just use it to recall vaguely how how it's supposed to go so mm. uh, so all read all manuscripts from the seventh seventh eighth centuries they have uh, these weird squiggles called uh, neumes in them which is before the time of the notation so and that makes up for a lot of uh, personal interpretation how, how to uh, to find those the melodies in that case. Not only yeah. the rhythm, but also with terms of the melody. So, sorry, another tangent. I, I tend to go off on these things. No, that's a that's a good that's a good <laughs> tangent, man. That's that's fascinating. <laughs> I, I I learned I it's it's a little weird for the United States that when I was a small child, when I first learned music, it was using the fixed do system. Oh yeah, ra- sure. uh, the solfege system rather than uh, the letter names, and so I've always felt a little out of place. Oh really? Oh, and yeah. and in some ways, I feel like uh, this is uh, this is just validating for me to to learn oh, about good, sort cool. of like the yeah, history no, it, behind I mean, that. If you, to, if, if you go to France, they the everyone everyone uses the the solfege system. Mm-hmm. So you have to because I have workshops in France sometimes, and I have to in my brain quick. Oh yes, that's a sol, and the yeah. la, and then a, a c bemol, which is the mm-hmm. the you know and so on. And you have to remember all those things, which is is uh, if you haven't grown up with it, it is it's. it's uh, bit confusing to learn new names but mm-hmm. basically, basically sol will be g so yeah so you have to, yeah. just to translate in your head but the way that you you eric like you personally have moved like across a lot of different musical instruments yeah but also across these different systems of notation mm-hmm. and um and obviously you also um uh sp- speak multiple languages for the spoken word as well uh, yeah, i wonder well, no. Um, well, well enough, uh, you know, um, <laughs> like, like personally, I have learned a second language, but no more than that. But mm-hmm. I hear my polyglot friends talk about how the more languages you learn, you know, yeah. in a lot of ways, the more natural that process becomes, you know, and I, yeah. and I wonder if you have any sort of insight as a, as a person who hops around on different instruments and stuff, you know, if, um, after mm. your, your, say your fifth distinctive instrument you know, is the sixth and seventh, et cetera. Do you ever reach a point where it becomes just such a natural yeah. thing to pick up an instrument and go, how many strings? Ah, I feel, I can feel where the music comes from rather than having to yeah, be very yeah. sure. scientific about figuring it out, you know? Yeah, exactly. Now, I mean, it's been compared sometimes to to uh, uh, knowledge of, of different languages has been compared to uh, playing different instruments. In, in, and I mean, in, in some ways it's right because, you know, if you, if you learn... Um, if you know Swedish, uh, it's not so hard to learn Danish or Norwegian because they are closely related. And the same would go with bagpipes, for example. If you know how to play one bagpipe, you have the basic technique down for you know blowing the bag and, and squeezing and so on. And then the fingering mm. might be a bit different from from other um, uh, pipes. But but if but if you were to start to play a, a trumpet or something, uh, that would be like learning Korean. Uh, yes, you know, a, a bigger jump, something totally yeah, a much different. Yeah, jump, and then you have yeah. something in between, like maybe learning French would be, uh, you know, playing the guitar or something like a string instrument, which mm. is fairly simple, but still, it's it's a new way of thinking, uh, basically. So yeah, no, I mean, I mean, and I, I don't, I mean, I, I speak um, obviously Swedish, English, and and German more or less fluent, and then uh, then I sort of dabble with French and Italian and and uh, other languages and Latin. Mm. Uh, I, that I, I wouldn't be able to hold a conversation in in Latin for sure, or even in French uh, mm. beyond school French. But it's well, no one's going to call you out for it on this show. I'll tell you that much. Oh, thank God! Yeah. <laughs> but it, the, but, it, I, but it's it's the way the way you listen. I mean, it's often been said also that musicians have 
because you have the ear for listening to music, so you have the ear for um, for languages. So uh, in a way, it might be easier for some musicians to to pick up the sound of a specific language. So uh, hmm. if you speak uh, like now, my my English is certainly not perfect, and it's it's I I wish I could have a better pronunciation, um, but I still have sort of the basic ideas about the inflection of the languages uh, of the language. And when I speak French or or German, it's it's or, or Swedish, it it changes. Um, I, or even Swedish. Change. Sorry. Uh, did you say or Swedish? Or Swedish, yeah. I mean, we, we, sure. I mean, as well. When I speak English, I I I tend to speak in a slightly lower pitch. I think. Interesting. Um, when I go to yeah. Swedish, it's much it's a bit more sing songy like Swedish is, and then I would my pitch would be higher. And um, so each language has its like instruments has it. I think has its own. Uh, yeah, peculiarities with, with with terms to 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 the sound of it. Mm. Obviously, that reminds me, Erica. I remember a, uh, one time when I was young, um, some of my dad's Swedish friends had come to visit, mm. and one of them mentioned that uh, we all ought to because we liked the Muppets. We watched the Muppets a oh, lot yeah. at home, mm. and he wanted to make sure we knew that the Swedish chef was Norwegian. <laughs> does, that, does that sound about right to you too? Uh, we we have, we have never been quite sure what he is actually. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> because he, he, he sometimes he sounds more Danish to us. Ah, gotcha. Uh, because Danish is, is has a totally different sound than than Norwegian and Swedish. Mm. And uh, yeah. uh, to me, that always sounded slightly more like South Danish. Oh, but... see, I, I I thought you were speaking Swedish just now. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm just, just joking. Sounds, <laughs> sounds, you know, it's, 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 it's just exactly joking. Same, just joking. So, yeah, of course. <laughs> oh, but yeah. Erica, the you know, when I was a kid, I was once told that I needed to stop hopping from one instrument to another and mm. focus on one. Oh no, no, oh, no! By a music teacher, I, I that's I wanted to know if you would give similar advice. I suspect <laughs> no, <if> not. <laughs> no, well, I mean, it depends on on what you want to do with your life, I suppose. Uh, mm. If you want to be a concert pianist, obviously that would be uh, helpful, probably to focus on that. But but I mean, if 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 you want to have fun and and. Uh, you know, make a living as well. Uh, it's I. I would just recommend to try out as much as possible and and see what some some uh, because it's it's some instruments are, are just fun to play and and uh, some are a chore and I mm. you know and uh, recorder I always found to be a chore. It's it's much it's so difficult and it, to make it sound really good. It's 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 uh, takes much more effort than you get out of it. Uh, no offense, I mean I mean recording a good recorder player is amazing, and uh, mm-hmm. I can never get it. It's like when I try to speak French, I can never get it to sound just right. And when I play the recorder, it doesn't really come out um, in the beautiful way that I want it to. So that's why I stick to bagpipes, I suppose, mm. uh, as opposed well, to harps, uh, a harp or a, which is you know you you tune it and then you, you sort of have a instant gratification uh, mm. it sounds nice bagpipes are sort of in, in between if you're lucky and they're in tune they can sound wonderful and if you're if it's out of tune we all know what bagpipe, bagpipes can can mm. sound like so yeah yeah and and speaking of harps you used a a, a medieval style harp i think for this album is that right yeah uh, exactly so called gothic harp i think we have another gothic two uh, which is it's called gothic because it's uh, uh, <clears throat> it's from the Late. For, well, this one will be from the late four, and actually late late fifteenth century. So it's quite late for for the for the time. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, it, it's it's a sort of has a gothic architecture feel to, to it. It looks a little bit like a like a. It, it sort of st- strives towards the heaven, much like the gothic mm-hmm. cathedral cathedrals would do, and they would have some uh, take some inspiration in, in the construction from uh, how you would construct a, a, a church ceiling, basically with with a. With the, the construction of the harp, so it's it's a beautiful, absolutely beautiful instrument, um, and um, but it, it and it has this totally other sound than uh, than a normal beautiful metal string or nylon string harp. You have the the, the gut strings, and mm. uh, sometimes also the the bray pins, which I'm not. sure. Oh yeah, that's we, the that buzzing sound. Is yeah, that right? May, may Tell me about that. that. No, we, we I think we used it on on a couple of instances, but it, it's basic because almost all harps. That you find uh, on paintings, and also the few, very few instruments which uh, are, remain um, in original, all from the harps from the 14th to the 16th century, basically have all have these little pins that that come out of where the string is attached, and um, 
uh, which is something called a bray pin, which makes the string go bzzz instead mm. of just going pling. And um, is that uh, like the is it is it called a bray pin? Then I mean, I know that a bray is a word that we have for like the sound that some yeah. animals make, like yeah, exactly, they're braying. Yeah. Uh, I, I think so. It, it's it, it's uh, onomatopoetic, so it in, in, imi- mm. imitates the sound of the. The bray, the the, mm. the buzz, the buzzing in in this case, because it, basically it's a small wooden um, thing that just touches. It, it doesn't shorten the string, the length like a fret. It, it just touches um, uh, the, the string, so it gets this um, buzzing sound. So it sounds like something is slightly broken first, but then you realize it's, it's supposed to be like that. And you find the same thing with the. Uh, on a drum, you would put on uh, the snare, the snare drum. Oh, sure. Uh, so you get the same buzzing thing. And on a, obviously on a, on a hurdy-gurdy, where you have the mm-hmm. uh, the same, you have a, the second, the, the, called the trompet, which is the little bridge that buzzes also when you uh, turn the wheel faster, so you get the rhythm going. So you, and, and the, the crumb horn also has this sort of buzzing sound to its quality. So, I mean, it, it's sort of an a ingredient in, in many instruments. and uh, mm-hmm. But it's, it's a bit peculiar that the harp would have it also because it's uh, if you put that i mean today uh, when you have it you usually usually you would use it on a couple of strings in the bass like a accompaniment um which sound sounds quite cool but uh, i think in, in middle ages you would have used that on all the strings and mm. which makes your harp sound like sort of something out of a 1980s kind of synthesizer or a computer yeah, game. Yeah, how interesting. It's, it's really, it really sounds really weird. If, if you, yeah. I mean, if you Google Bray Harp or Bray Pin Harp, I'm sure you can come up with um, example. There are some harpists who, who really dive into this and only uh, do recordings with a complete set of Bray Bray pins on their harp, and it sounds mm. not nothing like a harp at all. You start, what is this instrument? You know, before you realize it's actually a harp. So probably harps, and it's a way also of making the harp louder because it, it carries much more. In an ensemble, uh, it, it, it you can it sticks out much more than a, a harp without breakpins would. So it's, it was probably a way of making the harp uh, be a bit louder as well, uh, mm. but also a, a way of um, just d- changing the the timbre of the harp to, into something completely different. And there is even a, a description of someone uh, in the 16th century, I think, hearing a harp without the breakpins, and he was surprised because the sound was so mellow and melodious a sweet almost like a lute uh, which you know that's not what they associated the no, harp exactly with. <laughs> that that's what, what not what he, at least he would have associated what he associated the harp with how funny uh, so uh, yeah so it, it, it's kind of interesting that it's uh, not not as you would expect the, the the soft beautiful nice sound of the harp at all yeah. times now you mentioned that that kind of buzzing sound seems to have been an ingredient in the in the music of the time mm. speaking yeah, of yeah. ingredients uh this album is not just a collection of music, it's also a cookbook. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. We've got things like Pasta de la Pestilencia yeah. <laughs> included in the in the dust jacket in the in the cover. What yeah. what what was the thinking behind putting yeah, together some that's, recipes? That's our, own, that's our own name for it. Um uh, the the story about that, I mean we did a our old uh, the first CD we made like twenty years ago was together with uh, with a, a good friend who is a, a culinary archaeologist or a food historian, mm. basically. And he had all these wonderful recipes for a medieval, uh, uh, well, medieval recipes. And so when we did this, the Plague CD, we really wanted to have, uh, I wanted to have some um, uh, recipes again that would be, uh, you know, maybe something like a, a, a cure for the plague or something, which... Uh, it's somewhere in the did it, it, it didn't make it to the recipes but there's some I think it's in the some other place uh, where you take all kinds of disgusting stuff and you just put it together uh, and you supposedly help against the plague but we wanted to have something that you can actually uh, cook and use as well so uh, the pasta de la pestilentia is uh, <laughs> yeah. a plague dinner basically with a lasagna which is uh, a medieval dish uh, and where we chose the lasagna was was because it, it's also quite morbid because there's a description of, of an Italian chronicler who describes that um, the plague, there were so many corpses. So you would take, you would dig enormous graves and you would throw in all the bodies and then you would put a layer of uh, dirt and, and uh, soil in between and you would put another layer of people and then another layer of, of soil, just like when you are making a lasagna, when you would oh take the goodness. meat and wow. the pasta in between. That's yeah. specifically how the chronicler describes it. In, That's in how the, he described it. Wow. In the 13, 14, 17, 
That would be enough to put you off a lasagna the rest of your life. Yeah, exactly. He compares it to a lasagna. So, yeah. So that's why we um, (laughs) took that uh, horrible uh, Marchione di Coppo Stefani. What's yeah. his name? And um, so, and then the Libro della Cucina, it's from the 14th century, where, yeah, he just describes not not the same guy, but uh, another, uh, but it's the, the same time. So we just had to go with that. Hmm. It, so, it strikes me as interesting that, like, I'm sure other people have thought about this, and, and so this isn't an original thought, but I just, hmm. I had never thought of before how, um, like, food archaeology might be, or culinary archaeology. Hmm might be in some ways similar to the work that that you've been doing with music, where it's like there are some material remains, like um, some fragments of the instrument as they existed, some bits of manuscript that describe the music, but you can't hear the music Mm. that was happening. And in a similar way, we maybe have shards of the pots and cooking implements and some recipes, but we can't actually taste exactly how it was being made. And so there's this element of, um, Mm. I don't know, exploration and guesswork, I guess. Oh yeah, absolutely. Now you, you, you're uh, very right about that because we also, when we um, the first uh, recording we did was we did a festival with was a, f- a food and music festival because we believe that you know what, one way of transporting you to uh, another time is to listen to music. Of course, uh, it, it can be in you know, 1960s music or 1920s music or 17th, 18th century music, and you're sort of more or less transported to that era. Mm-hmm. And when you hear medieval music, you supposedly, you know, think of medieval times, a medieval scene, and not not medieval times, the restaurant, obviously, but um, uh, that would be something different. Uh, so, so uh, analogous to that would be to uh, to taste, to have while you listen to the music, and you would have the taste uh, of of the food. And um, we 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 have played at so many medieval banquets for society, in like the SCA, the Society for Creative Anachronism, mm. uh, American. Uh, uh, society for medieval history re- yeah. or reenactment different reenactment societies where where you you play music and you have the the food more or less sometimes extremely well researched and and uh, reconstructed and sometimes a bit more well I, I think food historians always want to go beyond the the image of of the medieval um, king sitting gnawing at a bone of lamb or, just, or mutton or right or just an entire chicken. boar's leg or something yeah exactly like and you yeah. throw it to the dogs and you know just <laughs> right and and on while it was extremely uh, sophisticated and and uh, we have tons of cookbooks uh, obviously they don't say you know take three uh, cups and one deciliter of this and that but it's take a pinch of this and and uh, but they give clear instructions for what to use and uh, which ingredients and some, how it should taste sometimes so it, it's definitely uh, possible to um, to uh, to put a lot of uh, time and, and uh, effort into researching how food would taste and together mm. with the music that makes it uh, because you get this obviously the taste but also the the smell and you know when when I um, I've been to so many medieval festivals and when I smell certain things like like cooking food cooking meat in like a wine sauce with cinnamon uh, which is mm. typ- like a typical medieval spice very very expensive of course in the Middle Ages but you would use cardamom and and cinnamon, which today are uh, mostly used for um, for Christmas cooking, uh, mm-hmm. at least here. So when you when you uh, s- when you smell that, you sort of get instantly transported to to a medieval uh, experience that you had before. Mm. Um, also, like uh, boiling uh, like tar and stuff like that, which has very specific smell. Is is it? It kicks uh, kicks something in your head at, at once, and if you combine that with music, you do get quite close to a sort of time machine feeling, which is what what you uh, for many people what they want to experience when they listen to medieval music and and uh, yeah. and the food, and even better if you're you know in, in a castle or in a um, surroundings which evoke that as well. So yeah, sure. I'd imagine as as many elements as possible bring mm. them together to kind of get immersed. I mean, clothing too. I'm sure. I mean. You know, yeah, the the sure. impressive clothing that you show up wearing for some of your performances. Um, in fact, yeah, it's, those it's... glasses, Eric, What what's going on with those glasses? Are those a, an authentic replication <laughs> oh, of yeah, something? Yeah, or sure. is that a... For sure. Wow. They're, uh, I mean, uh, they go back to uh, at least the 12th, or at least the 13th century when uh, some monks would use, uh, uh, gl- yeah, perfectly modern glasses, really. Well, yeah. not, they, they would have a wooden frame and, 
We don't know if they would tie them up like you often see people doing today, that you, you have your hands free. Yeah. Probably you would have used them to to hold while like reading glasses. But I mean, they're sure. perfectly serviceable lenses uh, that people could um, could cr- could craft all back in the 12th or 13th century. I, so, I love that at least yours that I see in the photos and all, um, mm. they seem to be hinged so you could even close them up really effe- uh, yeah, effectively yeah, yeah, and yeah, put them in your pocket. Exactly. You, you, yeah, you just um, uh, pull them together and they, they yeah. fold away in the pocket or something. And uh, I mean, I, I got mine from, a, a I think it was a Dutch optician who made a, a he made, he uh, he went around on on medieval markets uh, selling medieval glasses because that was oh wow so he could he could, he could them, actually so. get you your prescription and everything no he, yeah he had like like fifty sixty different already made custom glasses and you would just try wow. out and he he could fit the lens uh, to a specific uh, frame and so on so it was <laughs> really really cool and uh, so I, oh go ahead Eric. no no I just want to say that it it's also a way of of it adds to the costume obviously. Um, we 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 sometimes perform in like modern black uh, uh, um, what the, just just modern clothes you know non oh sure yeah yeah sometimes when it calls for that but but usually depends a bit on the venue and so on and, and the surroundings but we we do like to perform in in medieval costumes because it sort of goes with the with the repertoire and I mean obviously if you play music from the eighteen hundreds you don't expect orchestras to have 19th century clothing and and so on but mm-hmm. but for medieval music it's it's uh, sort of has become uh, sometimes even expected of you to have medieval clothes if you play medieval music so some so often we do that not not always but but often so the glasses are a way of enhancing that as well because it makes you look a bit well a bit weird frankly but which is yeah. sometimes something to be uh, to be um, cherished because it, it's you know I, I sometimes wish that I would be uh, like I had a big giant nose that, or something that would make me look a bit more um, um, <laughs> peculiar still in time, medieval Eric. sense, <laughs> missing an arm or something. Ah, uh, right, yeah. <laughs> so, so uh, just having a, a weird glasses is, I guess, my way of of sticking out a bit more. So, yeah. yeah. Well, I I feel like um, it, it it makes a lot of sense. I, I'd imagine that for the audience, it adds to the experience, this sort of transportative kind of experience. But probably yeah, for yourself sure. as well to be, like sort of embody the performance that you're giving in a in an even more. Mm. Yeah, sure. Mm, I don't know, authentic way, I guess. Yeah, no, absolutely. It depends on what you want to, what what your purpose is, wh- why you play medieval music in the first. I mean, is is it for pure enjoyment and appreciation of the the music itself? And uh, then obviously you don't need, uh, you don't wouldn't need medieval clothes to to com- complete the experience. You would just sure. close your eyes and you would listen to the to the exquisitely um, composed and hopefully performed music, but. Uh, for most people, I think it's it's a sort of a package deal that you you listen to the medieval music, um, which is tunes that most people have never heard before or are not familiar with, um, and then you, uh, yeah, it just raises the experience a bit to see the, the color because obviously it's not uh, all you know drab, uh, brown, um, uh, ugly clothes in the Middle Ages. I mean, you would have obviously poor people who couldn't afford fancy clothes, but when you get to musicians and especially musicians in an official capacity they would have more often than not they would have extremely fancy clothing and with lots of colors and even with mm. poor people who couldn't afford that they they would still uh, very much appreciate lots of color in their in their clothing and and it is quite easy to dye clothes with uh, with the natural colors in in uh, at least with you know some colors like blue and violet would be more expensive because you would use you would have to use uh, stuff that you could only import from like the far east so that would be uh, mm. um, for the for the for the wealthy people and and you also had there were even um, you, you could actually be fined if you dressed sort of above your station if you <laughs> as a peasant dressed yeah. too fancy you would be uh, you could actually be be uh, punished for that so, so yeah, don't, they, don't, they, don't get too don't get too crazy yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly don't get don't get too cocky well, I, I wonder, I, I might be stretching it here, Eric, mm-hmm. and so you tell me if I'm wrong. I might be, um, you know, trying to get things to connect that don't need to. But I, I think it's fun, maybe, to imagine. Like mm-hmm. you mentioned that the in the Rick, Rick Spellman, Rick Spellman yeah. Um, yeah. word there, that this, sure. the spell there in the middle yeah. is like the, uh, to, like to play, to play the instrument, that yeah, kind of thing. Yeah. And and I, I know that I've gone down little etymological rabbit holes before 
mm. regarding the English word spell, like oh, yeah. a magic spell, right? Yeah, but also, right. yeah, exactly. We have a phrase like sit, come and sit down for a spell, for a spell. and that yeah. seems to maybe come from like for a story, right? Uh, yeah. The spell having to do with, or or maybe even this is maybe even tied to like string and yarn, and how sometimes we talk about a story being a yarn, mm. you know. Um, mm. Exactly, and yeah. and I I don't know when you mentioned that like the um like the one of those the flagellation song that you played on the harp in this album right that mm. there are lyrics there there's so many verses because it's telling a story you know and I I don't know I like the idea that maybe there's um there's something about uh storytelling and music making and maybe food making as mm. well that like all of this is somehow coming from the same place yeah, or, or reaching absolutely. for a similar that's, thing that's a great idea I mean I I also I I love to go into um to fall into etymological rabbit holes it, it's mm. it's so interesting um especially with with the uh, i mean english and swedish would have been the same language uh up mm-hmm. until a, a thousand years ago or something yeah. or maybe even closer like maybe eight nine hundred years you, you would could understand if you came from anglo-saxon england you would certainly be able to communicate with someone from norway or sweden because it would mm-hmm. would, would be the germanic uh, proto-language um uh, which later only become the different dialects and eventually into Swedish and English. So so you find all of these different really cool stories behind words. And and definitely, I mean, in, in German, you would say spielen uh, and spielen to spela in Swedish, uh, mm. which is the same word, obviously. And, and uh, English lost it, but uh, presumably, as you say, kept it in spell, which with something, I mean, you always connected spells and magic also with music in a way. So, mm, yeah. Uh, so yeah, definitely. I mean, you, you, as a as a, um, a very clever, uh, a very talented musician could spell bind his audience, and they ah, do it to I'm this thinking day. Pied Piper of Hamelin and things. Yeah, like exactly. That, yeah. They would cast mm. a spell on the on the audience, and well, I mean, you can still say that you know the the violinist was his spell. He, he was spellbinding, you know. You can yeah, that. absolutely, yeah. And and spell spell, it's so similar word. So I have to look into that later if that's is is indeed the same word because in Swedish German we don't have a, a, at all the same word for a, a spell. Like you you cast a spell mm-hmm. uh, uh, in Swedish that is called a besvärjelse. Oh, it's very different. Yeah. So spell besvärja to swear. That's the swear. Um, probably the, to, to swear because when you swear, oh, also okay, you, that's it's like a holy, in English we also have a curse. Yeah, yeah you, exactly. You put you yeah, exactly. You curse. You you swear. Mm. That uh, I'm not sure if that's connected some way to spell, but I would rather think, as you say, it's to sp- and also of course to to play uh, in English means uh, to play uh, for fun, to play with as a child, and to play yeah. music. Um, which we used to say in Sweden as well, um, Swedish as well, not not anymore. Uh, but if if you're a uh, lek, um, yeah, so leka uh, uh, is uh, is the word for playing as a child. A child uh, is playing. He he and leker, um, which is you can actually use in Scottish. You can say uh, the the baron is leaking, which means the the child oh. is playing, which is the barn oh, is in Swedish, and the baron is yeah. leaking in Scottish. So you have all these, like the oh. sounds like the barn is leaking, but it's 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 uh, the children is the child is playing. Um, yeah. So these these words which are are the same. And um... hey, friends, thanks for joining in uh, to listen to this episode. I really enjoyed talking to Eric. I hope that it's been fun to listen to the conversation. There's still a bit of the conversation left here. I just am popping in to say hello and remind you that you can write into the show if you'd like to. Um, I'm also going to be just a little bit commercial here and let you know that um, I've got some summer sales going with ba- over at bagpipeswag.com. Uh, right now we're doing $20 tanks, uh, tank tops that is, uh, for $20 a piece. Um, so all of our tank tops are, are deeply discounted at present. And from there we'll, we'll move on to some other... I'm not sure yet if we're going to do uh, like some swimwear sales, maybe some uh, like uh, water bottle or other drink carrying sales, that kind of stuff. But just through the summer, I'll just change that up every few weeks and announce it on social media. So feel free to follow the uh, um, bagpipe swag on social media as well. Um, 
And, you know, I, I don't really have a super graceful way to tie that in to, to the interview with Eric, except uh, maybe I kind of do. Um, he mentions in the interview that, uh, like, even the sort of longer book, that companion book that I was reading, that really is a lot of fun. It's got a lot of um, art as well as um, explanations and translations, etc. through it. Uh, he mentions that he's got an even longer version there, too. Um, and I've been looking through it, and... A couple of the tank tops feature a new series of designs that I'm only just, I've only just started putting them up on Bagpipe Swag. Um, I think I've got two up there so far as of recording, but uh, it's kind of a series that will yield more designs. And I've been working on these. I was just looking at the project in the tablet where I was doing the, the work on them. Um, some of the reference images I imported a year ago. So I've been working on these for a while, but in a lot of ways, much longer because this is the source from whence comes the bagpipe swag um, logo is uh, the Dance Macabre uh, folios or, or booklets uh, that became popular in the um, oh, 13th or 14th century. Um, and uh, Eric has a little bit of information about those, including, and, and it's great that this paragraph that he has in the book is accompanied by the very so there are a lot of different versions of these of these booklets and and uh, sort of uh, paintings and and etchings and um, it's kind of a motif the the dance of death um, and he has the uh, uh, an extract from the exact version uh, that I used for the logo for bagpipe swag so it's kind of fun um, and uh, and yeah so a couple of those designs are already up on the site and a couple more will go up over the next little. Anyway, uh, here's what Eric says about him uh, in his booklet. He says, uh, the dance of death. Oh, and there are a few Italian and French names and words here that I might just skip over, uh, or I'll just do a terrible job pronouncing them. But <laughs> here's what he says. The dance of death, or the danza macabre, or sal saltatio mortis, is an, it, uh, is an example of a new phenomenon in art, literature, and music that first appears in the late 14th century, most likely as a delayed reaction or coping mechanism to the trauma that the enormous amount of death and suffering must have caused. And then a parenthetical here, just that it is estimated that somewhere between a third and half of all the people in Europe have perished. Um, that would be 25 to 30 million people. Um, continuing... One of the first examples is the poem Je fille de macabre la danse. I probably should have skipped over that one, sorry. A poem uh, written by Jean La Fevre, Fevre after he recovered from the plague in the 1370s. For music, one of the most well-known, at least until saint Saens. I know I've heard that said before. Mm. 1874 had a, had a version. Um, is a, a tune that you do hear at the end of the album uh, called Ad Mortem Festinamus which is translated as, we hurry towards death. The reason this theme struck such a chord was probably due to the message that death doesn't care if you are a cardinal, king, or fool. He will come for you regardless, as these images from the late 15th century manuscript shows. Um, and those images are, I, I do think they're really cool. So uh, it's, it's a fun little uh, coincidence that I happened to be finishing up these designs just as uh, I was doing the interview with Eric. And so... Uh, hop on over to bagpipeswag.com, check those out. Feel free to buy stuff. I wouldn't stop you from buying stuff. And as long as I'm being real commercial anyway, feel free to sh support the show uh, over on Patreon if you'd like. There's links to all this stuff down below. And uh, aside from that, also just thanks for listening. And you can always support the show just by just by sharing it around. Uh, let your, your bagpipey, musicy friends know that it exists and see if they don't want to give it a little listen. Uh, thanks again. I'll get out of the way so you can back, get back to listening to Eric, this cool, cool guy. I really do want to have him back on the show, by the way. So if, if as you've been listening to him talk, uh, he covers so many different topics, you know. And so if anything here triggered interest in your in your head, feel free to uh, shoot me a message uh, via email or social media. And I will, I've got a little collection of questions I want to ask Eric anyway. And I'll just add your questions to the to the list and we'll see when we can get him back on. Oh, and uh, how silly of me. I almost forgot. We will be, of course, giving away a, a copy of this album to one Patreon supporter. So another good reason to hop onto the Patreon and do some regular giveaways. So let me grab my Cthulhu Dice Tower here. And let's uh, drop our dice down the Cthulhu Tower. Let's see who Cthulhu spits out. Oh, we got a one. That's going to be Benjamin Elzerman. Congrats, Benjamin. Thank you again for supporting the show. And uh, and uh, thank you to everybody who's supporting the show. You're all awesome. Everybody's awesome. Thank you so much for listening. I'm, I'm and, just uh, such a rambler. Let me get out of the way. Anyway, that's <laughs> a long tangent. 
not again. but it's so but it's so fun and i and i i wonder too do you feel like do you do you feel like cuz if if i'm not mistaken isn't wasn't your mother a famous poet yeah she yeah my my mother that's right she wrote books for yeah poetry books yeah exactly I, th- I thought that I had read that maybe her her she was like a best selling author at, by like the age of twelve or something yeah, it's, just it's, amazing it's, like it's that. A, that's a whole other weird story. But yeah, she no she started to write poetry when she was yeah twelve and and had it published and and was uh, and she was quite famous uh, back in the days that would be in the nineteen sixties. Um, I just wondered if um if you felt like there was any sort of um you know where with words stories poetry etc mm-hmm. right is this um. Were you raised in an environment where there was there was art in the air? Oh, yeah. You know, in a way, and did that lead you toward this path that you've taken, where it's just yeah, it's a good so question. much no, interesting, cool music stuff? You know? Yeah, no, not 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 particularly. I mean, it's it's. I, I think when when I came along, she had stopped writing by then. I think more or less, mm. um, and we were never really. I, I wasn't really raised in a musical home as such. So that was more later that I I, I turned to. Uh, I had some friends who played the the piano in in music school and and I uh, just thought it sounded like fun and so I, I started mm-hmm. actually playing the piano when I was that was my first instrument I was quite late I, mean, I was in probably fourteen or fifteen at the time before oh, really? that I hadn't, hadn't really played anything um, I think I would have assumed harp would have been first for you yeah no yeah because the harp and and the, the I think the harp was second because the harp and the piano are are quite similar and and mm. and so so when I I played the piano and then I had a, f- a friend who made a, a very basic harp for some reason, uh, but it was so much fun to play it. And and at that time also I, I started to go to medieval uh, festivals and so on and I uh, wanted to have, uh, just wanted to be able to make music uh, because I also had listened to, there were some really good music groups back in the 80s, which... Um, also, some Swedish groups who who started uh, recreating, or or um, bringing out medieval music, which was qu- quite early back then, quite unusual. Mm. So, um, and I, I just loved the sounds of the d- different instruments, and started to play a bit of recorder, and thought it it wasn't quite as fun. Uh, I thought it was had to be something more fun than a recorder. So I, that's how I came into bagpipes. Mm. And uh, it, it... yeah, then it's from then it just grew. I have had you here a long time, Eric. Are, are, are you exhausted? No, no, Would you no, like me no to bring this it, to a no, graceful it's, close? It's, it's great. You know, I, I, I love talking to to knowledgeable uh, people as you're Oh, if you make me blush. No, <laughs> but also who, who are interested in, in, in what I have to say. Because well, it's, just, it's, just uh, about everything you do say just triggers three more questions in my yeah, mind. No, and so how, I'm that's trying how to be, should be. I, mean, I can be here all night. It's no, no problem. No well, I'm I'm curious. Like we we were talking about about Abba earlier. Should I be mm. saying Abba? Is that better? Yeah. Should I say Abba? Abba would be the Swedish Abba. pronunciation. Abba. Abba. <laughs> we were talking about Abba. them earlier, and and it feels to me like Sweden is everywhere in modern music. It, uh, yeah. Whether it like it's I like to, I like Sweden has definitely managed to to uh, to lure its way into not not least thanks to to Spotify, which is also. Right, amongst other Swedish things, company. Spotify comes from Sweden. Yeah, yeah unfortunately, yeah, hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but the um, you know, my kids really well, and I like it too. My kids, but my kids have got me even yeah, more no, I, into I a used lot it of too, metal be- music, grudgingly because they you know. oh, Spotify, of course, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we have to, right? It's it's every yeah. we. I think a lot of us try to resist it, but there are some things that you can't get elsewhere, and so you end up. You yeah, end up no, I mean, I mean I'm old enough to remember the. The last tour we did, uh, actually to the States uh, in, in 05, 2005, 2006 maybe, which was just in the, the last death throes of the CD. But back then mm. you could actually finance a whole tour by just selling CDs and, and merchandise. Mm. So we went with, um, there's a, a, an American band called Volgemut. I don't know if you... Oh yeah, I know uh, the band, yeah. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're around, uh, Michael Gartner is the, the primus motor of Volgemut. He's, he's around his day place in, in America, all, all over mm-hmm. the place. And we had the great, uh, it was so so fun to play together for uh, like a, a year or something when um, uh, me and Anna, we filled out in, in Volgemut. And we mm. we got to, we, we had a, started out that he asked us if we wanted to go to Hawaii and play medieval music because he had a gig mm. there and he had lost his uh, his band at that time and didn't have any musicians. So, and you know, if you get an invitation to play medieval music uh, in in the, Maui, in Hawaii of all places, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> because there's there's a, 
SCA, the Society for Creative Anachronism, again, they have a chapter in, in uh, Hawaii too, of course. Oh. So they uh, they met there and, and had a big party and we played medieval music and it was great fun. And uh, um, yeah, and um, where was it going with all this? Um, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. OCDs. Yeah, and exactly. Spotify. Because yeah. then we, we also played at the, uh, the um, one of the biggest events the Pensick Festival in, in Pennsylvania, mm. where they have yeah. in August every year. It's like, I don't know, 50, 60,000 people go there. And I, they... I've never been, but I've watched documentaries oh, yeah, and, yeah, and they, video vlogs and stuff from there. Just, yeah. They build a whole village of, well, a city, basically. Of, of, I think it's at least 30, 40,000 people who come there. And some have their RVs and they, they and tents. And, but they basically, they build up a giant medieval town for uh, for like a week or something. And it's it was mm-hmm. just amazing to go there and... Uh, and play and, and musicians are very appreciated and uh, they didn't pay any fee for for to go there uh, so we mm. thought you know is it really worth it but then um we had uh, like 2000 CDs or something and, and I, I was you know, we were never going to sell all these but you know after one week they were all gone so ah. it was just crazy you could really they were selling like hotcakes uh, <laughs> yeah <laughs> which, and that was the last then 2 years later uh, it was just impossible because then uh, Spotify or or uh, at least Napster, I think, uh, back in the day had come along. Yeah, and LimeWire on those. Yeah, things. so now suddenly it just disappeared, which is you know, yeah, hmm, too bad. Well, to to the, to that note, um, in the show notes for this episode, there will be a link to the Bandcamp page and your website. And, oh yeah, cool, uh, great. Let, yeah, let us all work together to keep music alive. Yeah, that's great. No, Gosh I mean, Bandcamp is, is, uh, um, is great because you actually, and also, I mean, it's not a matter of, of the, the CDs. I agree that, that um, digital music is obviously much more uh, uh, easy to handle on, on these days. But mm. uh, it's also that, well, on Spotify, you, do, you don't, uh, for one thing, you don't get all the cool lighter notes, which right. I agree, which I just find so stupid. I mean, they surely they could have found a way of, Having the like a PDF or something of the liner notes because often that's what you want to read about. Uh, well, this one that comes with thirteen fifty is it's it's a it's like a magazine. It's yeah, delightful. it's pretty extensive. And I even made a yeah. the one uh, the digital version is even bigger. I don't know if you saw that one, but that actually has fifty pages. That oh no, that's not what I'm looking at right oh, now. Yeah. Actually, I'll check have to that go out. That's uh, that's like the extended version. It's, mm. I I went all in and I did like uh, I think it's a fifty page booklet uh, in the in the digital version. All oh, so, right, I'll have I have even more to enjoy then. Oh yeah, yeah, that's uh, I can I can send it to you if you don't have it um, accessible there. But yeah, so it was just a way of of putting in a, well you you want the lyrics put in of course and stories about the the music and yeah. uh, and everything. So um, I, 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 I I missed that with with Spotify. Um, but also, of course, that with uh, I like to own the music because Spotify tends, you know, w- w- uh, if one musician gets pissed with Spotify, they would just pull their music from the it's service. Gone. Yeah, and then you can't listen to it anymore, so you don't actually mm-hmm. own the music. So I like to uh, to purchase MP3s uh, in that I, I I actually own the tunes, uh, well, mm-hmm. the, the music in that way. So and that, then with Bandcamp, that's that's good because you actually have physical, well, not physical, but but files on your computer right you can download so, them yeah exactly yeah. it's a bit old school these days yeah but it's cool to be old school yeah um, I, th- I think so also <laughs> but but as as a person who's well versed in in like um sort of sweden's uh musical history mm. do you see aspects of swedish traditional and folk music coming out in things like uh hooked on a feeling right oh yeah is is it, that was the best part of the Guardians of the Galaxy movies, I think, is when, when Hooked on a Feeling comes <laughs> on, right? Checker, it's like, checker, uga, 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 <laughs> right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and where I'm, you know, like I'm outside of the tradition, so I don't know what would be an identifiable aspect, <laughs> but I'm just curious as a person inside the tradition, you know, are there things like that or in, well, in death uh, I mean, metal music or in electronic dance music, these things that seem to be so heavily influenced by, by Sweden? Is there stuff there or is it totally a different tradition? Well, uh, I, I guess you could shoehorn it in somehow if you really wanted to. But uh, mm. apart from what we touched on before, that it, it's uh, sort of a sense for uh, for um, beautiful melodies. I'm not sure it mm. goes beyond that. But um, but I'm, I'm, yeah, it, it would be. I'm, I'm sure some musicologist somewhere has has um, 
done a, a story about that. Uh, sure, sure. But it, it's, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, if it goes back to the fact that a lot of Swedish people go to music school when they're small and learn to play an instrument or learn to sing, like Sweden is, I think, the country with mm. the most per capita choirs in the whole world. Oh, is it? It's, I didn't realize that. It's, it's like a, it's a, a folk, you would say folk movement in Swedish, uh, uh, that it, it's something which almost everyone does or knows someone who sings in a choir or, or stuff like that. And um, so you, 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 to some extent, you, you get raised with, with and, and with those choirs, you obviously sing a lot of Swedish uh, folk songs that everyone knows uh, also. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I, I mean, you get, uh, you, you get in, infused with it in, in some ways, for sure. But uh, I'm not sure if that correlates to, to pop music in, in, yeah. in more ways. I have, I have watched, I, even though I don't speak Swedish, I have watched and enjoyed several um, school presentations that you have done with other musicians mm. that are on YouTube. Mm. Okay. And it's, it's so, it, it's so fun for me to hear little kids speaking a foreign language yeah. in the first place. Like anyway, like when you ask them a question, I, you know, I don't know exactly what you're asking them, but then they yell out like, sock people, you know, and like, Oh, I, I see, you know, <laughs> yeah, no, but that's, that's fun anyway. But it does, um, do you spend a lot of time doing like school outreach things? Is that, is that a big part of what's happening in Sweden in general or part of your focus? Yeah, it's, it, 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 it comes and goes, I would say. Uh, Anna does more, she does more than me because she does uh, solo shows for, for schools with based on mm. uh, children's stories and, and famous fairy tales and stuff like that. And uh, Oh, yeah, I remember her um, Billy Goat's Gruff. Billy I Goat's think she Gruff, did a... yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, that's right. And uh, she has a, a like a Viking saga uh, about mm. strong empowered female vikings um, very cool and uh, a new medieval one man show and she's starting to do a fourth now because i mean also in, in still in sweden uh, even though we have a, a right wing government right now that is doing their best to uh, drive away things culture cultural mm. uh, and it's still uh, there are still surprisingly um important to for for the schools and so on to have uh, cultural aspects for the kids so if it's music mm-hmm. or history or whatever um and also and lots of libraries put on shows for um for kids so uh, uh yes yeah, i mean sweden loves uh, uh, doing stuff for for children so that that's also why i did my my pirate show because it's it's uh, mm. usually when it's a festival or something there there uh, people are um, Want want there to be uh, something specifically for kids as well, so mm. uh, I don't know if it's com- more compared to other countries, but it's it's still uh, music for uh, music and culture for for children is, is is considered quite important, which is I think is a, a great thing. Oh yeah, I well I couldn't agree more. Absolutely. Um. So I think Eric, if I if I had to, yeah. not that I would ever want to have to, but if I had to pick a favorite track from this album, yeah. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I go back and forth. I'm not sure. But I think maybe at least a contender would be track four. Co- comment comment quoi, 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 quoi. Yeah, yeah, the, the, that the, one. The, I just, I really like it. Yeah. And, and you know, maybe because of the piping background, I get especially excited when the pipes drop in. Um, but yeah. there's great vocals, really cool harping and the pipes and the percussion is so much fun. Um, I wonder if maybe this is how we round it out. Could you maybe tell me a bit about that track, the instrumentation that goes into sure. it? Um, yeah, I mean... And uh, maybe we'll kind of fade into that track when I do the edit. Oh, yeah, perfect. No, I mean, it, it's, uh, it's it's a good representation of, of the whole uh, project uh, because it's uh, the, the Machot tune, which is, uh, again, this very famous composer from the mid-14th century. And um, uh, it's just one of those very nice melodies that has a big range and, and it's it, it's just a nice melody to listen to and and uh, obviously with it's monophonic so it all you get is uh, is the lyrics and one voice it, not not polyphonic um mm. and it's entirely up to you what to do with it we don't know if Masho would have played it instrumentally or if, if it would have been sung without a compliment or whatever so it's basically up to to the performer to come up with a, a good way of presenting uh the tune and i mean with with this um uh because this this CD was always going to be a studio project because the whole idea was to do it in iso- in, in isolation because mm-hmm. also we couldn't meet the other musicians so then we we had uh so on on that track we are four musicians so it's me and Anna who were 
obviously at home, uh, but then there is a, um, a great friend who plays the Rick, which is the, the small tambourine, um, mm. Daniel from Stockholm. But then we also had uh, one of the greatest musicians in the whole world, if you ask me, which is Shira Kamen, which is, uh, she. I mean, she alone makes up for uh, all the bad things Americans did over the last hundred years. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> sorry. Uh, no, but she's, she's a very good friend and such such an excellent musician. Uh, she, she would have been um, fiddling. Yeah, on, she plays the fiddle. She lives in in uh, in Berkeley, uh, in in, mm. in the Bay Area, and um, uh, she plays yeah violin and fiddle. And uh, we've been have played with her on a number of times on on uh, when we went touring in on California, mm-hmm. um, and she's just. You know, so just one of these musicians that brings out uh, stuff in yourself that you didn't know you had when you play together with her. Mm. Uh, so we really wanted her to be on this album, and uh, so we sent this, sent the stuff over um, to her, and uh, just basically asked her, to, "Can you do something fun here?" And uh, then she sent she back delivered, uh, didn't she? <laughs> lots of different takes, and it was I just had yeah. to. Uh, it was so fun in a kid in a candy shop to choose the different takes and and put her fiddle in. Uh, mm. Together with so I mean that's uh, that track is combination of of uh, of uh, straight up takes uh, uh, at home here with some really you know fiddly editing with where we take one part there and put it in there and so on and uh, mm-hmm. but I'm really happy with with the result there so it's it's great that you chose that because I'm I'm it's a, it's a favorite of mine as well actually. Uh, Mm-hmm. And, and I mean, it's another discussion maybe for a longer time, but it's the whole idea of uh, arranging or presenting medieval music in today's uh, Spotify infused world where, you, yeah. you know, you, you listen to a tune and after 20 seconds, if it's not good, you, you switch to something else because there's so much. Right. So, I mean, should you present medieval music in, if you want to present it in a very uh, historically informed manner uh, or period or historically correct or whatever you want to call it um and w- what would that mean i mean would it be very maybe it would just be one one uh, a male voice singing the the melody without any instruments or very like when this was all started in the 50s and the 60s and you would have very sparse accompaniment because mm. people were didn't you didn't know much about how to to play the instruments uh, back then and uh before you had learned all the peculiarities of, of the instruments and also what you could do and what you were sort of allowed in uh, to, to do uh, to make it sound medieval and mm. and with this uh, with with this recording i mean we wanted it to be uh, historically correct in the in the uh, manner of using only medieval instruments and hopefully somewhat con- correct pronunciation of like medieval french and italian um mm. and not use any stuff that medieval musicians wouldn't recognize except for mm. possibly then the whole idea of arranging a tune so you start with one instrument and then you have another joining in and then for the third verse those instruments drop out and you have uh, another coming in and then you have a drum pattern that change and you know you have basically a modern very modern way of thinking of arranging a tune um Mm. Which is that's that's interesting. Does that make it a really effective sort of gateway or introduction yeah, for someone exactly. like me? Because Cause I mean, if you have a f- fifteen me minutes in, of of, of uh, a bagpipe and a drum, I mean, it, sure, it's it's nice to listen to for maybe five minutes, but after ten minutes, you sort of get pretty tired of it, and uh, yeah, or a, or a recorder and a, a tambourine or something. So, and we went the other way of just pouring extra everything uh, on 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 the instrumentation also because we could we could because we we had the possibility to do it so we could do what we uh, really wanted with, without yeah. without on the other hand be, being too extreme and having you know 15 bagpipes coming in and and uh, and so on <laughs> right so it would it would still be something that we could actually pull off with for musicians mu- musicians on stage mm. but but maybe that we would use so I, yeah so i i couldn't resist to put in a, a bagpipe chorus in the middle there uh, while i still yeah. play the <laughs> other instruments as well because it's such a great tune to play on the bagpipes um, it, it fits so well yeah so. it's it's because you have to do all the the chromatic stuff which barely works but it's still i mean the notes mm. are still there so 
And it's again, it's one of those unbagpipey tunes that is just fun. Mm-hmm. And they, 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 that works surprisingly well with with drones as well. That even if the oh yeah the the um, uh, harmony changes with the underlying other instruments, you still have the drone going uh, on a on the same notes, which uh, mm. sometimes clashes. But then in, in, the, in the end, of course, it, it's, it matches. Come together. on, come 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 on,